Hey everyone, Aaron Stewart with The Little Black Couch. Thanks for joining me today for a quick live. I actually had a, a pretty cool discussion with somebody who heard one of the previous uh, videos about my time in Pakistan and where it kind of hit me that I wanted to be an entrepreneur just to um, be able to make more decisions for myself and stay out of harm's way. Perhaps, you know, not let a, uh, an employer tell me to go to the ends of the earth and put my life at risk to sell their stuff, right? So anyway, it was during this, I guess I left out a portion of the story. Um, I, I talked about when we landed in Lahore and the craziness of getting my luggage and, and all of that and, the, and the, just the throngs of people and everybody that we're trying to get through. And this little guy who approached me, he had a, he had a tag on. And he was a little guy. He was much smaller than I was, very slight. And he had, and I talked about him, he had, he had his right hand was, yeah, it was his right hand was, was all wrapped up in gauze and it was all bloody, right? It was just this bl big bloody stumpy thing, right? Wrapped in gauze. Anyway, he came and he talked to me, but he was the only one that approached me. And he said, hey, where do you need to go? I, you know, I pulled out my big sheet of paper before we had any electronic devices and said, hey, I need to go to this hotel. And he's like, okay, my brother drives a cab, we'll take you there. And I'm like, cool. He, he had tag on, he was allowed in to the secure area to see me, and by secure area, I mean the, on this side of the rope, you know, that it wasn't that secure. But he, he was there and he, um, I trusted him, he had a, he just had a way about him, right? And so I trusted him and went along and, and I, you know, the, the throng of people kind of closed in on us and we fought our way through. His brother is actually quite a bit bigger than him and he was the one that drove the cab, it was his cab. So they kind of forced their way through. I held onto my luggage, I had this big, huge uh, Samsonite rolling bag and I pushed it kind of through to kind of make the way for me and I had people pulling on me and grabbing my hair and all this kind of stuff. And um, so it was a little uh, disconcerting for sure. A new country, I'd never been to Pakistan before. Um, it was, um, I'd been to a, yeah, it was just, it was different. It smelled different, felt different. It was muggy, it was hot, it was dirty. The air was just dirty, you could smell fumes and dust and oh, it was just kind of a, a weird, you know, my clothes were sticking to me, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we, we get into the car and you know, the, everybody started yelling at me for dollars, 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 dollars. And so things are kind of crazy. I didn't have any dollars. I changed all my dollars in Amsterdam to rupees. So I had a pocket full of rupees and it wasn't in my pocket. It was in my, you know, my secret stash, you know, thing that we used to stick them down our shirts, right? So it was down in here protected. Uh, anyway, so we get into the car and they surround the car and they won't let it go and they're rocking it and they're screaming dollars, dollars, dollars. And um, anyway, so I got my little wallet thing out of my shirt and I pulled out and essentially had, I don't remember what I had. It was like a hundred dollars in rupees or something like that, but it was a pretty good stack. Um, the dollar went quite a ways in Pakistan at that time. So I had quite a bit of rupees and I just opened up the window big enough where I could throw out the money and it just went and people scattered there and they gave us enough room where the, um, we could drive out of there and, and as we were driving. Um, and I kind of went over that previously. So I'm in at a very sort of uncomfortable spot. Um, he, the uh, taxi driver, his brother, the bigger one, he's driving. And then this gentleman who talked to me, he was quite a bit, it was quite slight. Um, and he was in the back with me, which is also pretty interesting, right? You'd expect them to be uh, in the front. So I asked him, you know, why are you back here with me? And he told me, well, in case they got the doors or something open that, that you know, I, I needed to be here to, to help you. And I'm like, okay, look, you've got one hand, the other one's cut off and you're about half my size. What do you think you're going to do for me? Was what I was thinking. But I said to him, I said, um, well, um, I, I don't mean to be rude, but what happened to your, what happened to your hand? You know, why is it, when did that happen? Anyway, he, he kindly um, told me the story and it was, it was a tragic one. He, has, he was at work, uh, he was an accountant and they accused him of embezzling, of stealing and um, decided that he'd done it. And so part of his punishment was they lopped off his hand. Um, seems extreme especially when he said he was innocent and I'm not here to say whether he was or not. He seemed like a nice guy, 
but they lopped off his freaking hand. And, um, I, and I, I, so I was a little kind of taken aback by that conversation, but, and then I asked, well, when did it happen? And he said, oh, yesterday. And I don't know how that works. I don't know if they cauterize it. I don't know what they do when they lop off your hand. I mean, they lop it off and then help you so you don't bleed to death? It, that none of it made any sense to me. But there he was, and that was his story. And I sat there looking at him just like, I'm sure he, I was aghast, right? I, I couldn't come up with anything to talk to him about, uh, to, to really explain, uh, to, to really kind of get an idea of what he's doing. And yet I felt just this, um, this kinship for this guy that I can't explain uh, other than we're just two people trying to make it, you know, in the world. I wasn't married at the time, I was single. And uh, so I asked him why he was back to work so quickly after such a, a terrible, in, after such a terrible injury. And he said, um, my family needs me. And I thought, you know what? I wanna be like that. There's a lot of times, it, it, was, a, it was a really uh, important thing for me to learn from in a very strange place. And it was because there was probably so much emotion going on that it made such a big impact on my life. Um, but I wanted to feel that way. I wanted to feel like that when I went to work and that when I did what I do, that um, I did it for, if you do it for somebody else, then it doesn't matter the pain and the trauma and the difficulty that you face. And he obviously had a, an, an immense amount of all of that. But if you're doing it for something bigger than yourself, then you can pretty much handle anything. And that's what this, this gentleman proved to me. And I wish I remembered his name. I know it's written down in my journal somewhere, but I can't remember his name. But that's what I learned from that. And I think as entrepreneurs, we need to keep that in mind. So if we get too caught up in the, um, what a, a very uh, important person in my life used to say, if you get caught up in the thick of thin things, right? If you get caught up in the things that really don't matter much, if you try to use the things that don't matter much as your motivation, then you will have a very difficult time as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur. because it gets difficult and it gets real there are challenges, there are, every day is a new challenge, There's, you have to learn new tasks, new, um, new skills very quickly because it demands your instant um, reaction and you need to take action and you have to do it sometimes without really knowing full well what's going on and that's a hard way to live. So if we have our motivation and our focus and our um, I guess if we have all of our priorities aligned to something that's much bigger than ourselves, much bigger than, than secular-based objects, I mean, I, I couldn't do what I do as an entrepreneur if it was just about money. Money doesn't, money doesn't move the needle for me very much. Um, I love to have it to pay my bills and taxes and all that. I'd love to have it so we can uh, eat at, at nice restaurants and, and, and so we can you know, drive nice cars and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's definitely a benefit. It's definitely something that makes life easier to live, but it's not worth something, but it's not something to get you to do things as hard as being an entrepreneur. I don't believe that money is a big enough motivator to make you do the things that you have to do to get it done right, you know? So um, with that then, uh, that's what I learned from this gentleman is that it was, man, that's freaking me out. Can you see that right there? It's like a leaf in a plant bouncing up and down. Sorry, I just, caught, I just saw that. So uh, that, that's the big lesson in all of this, is make sure that when you are going after your dreams, that your, your motivation is something much bigger than just a new car, or just uh, nice clothes, or just vacations, or just whatever. Because if you can find something that's more important than those things, when the tough times hit, you'll be able to blow through them because what's driving you is not going to be able to stop you because your thoughts and your motivations are far beyond anything that this world can throw at you.
if that makes sense. That's helped me a lot over my, my life. And as, uh, as we started talking again about this guy and his hand and somebody wanted to know what in the world, you know, I mentioned him earlier in that, uh, in that uh, video, but then didn't talk about this guy or how it happened or whatever. And it was just funny to me that somebody was still curious about it. So there you go. That's the rest of the story. They did get me safely where I needed to be. They did exactly what they said they would do. And they followed through. And, it, and he was uh, exemplary because he was living for something bigger than himself. He was living for his family. So hopefully that's helpful to somebody. And um, being an entrepreneur is truly a challenge. It's um, difficult. It's rewarding to be able to create solutions for problems that nobody else has thought of, to be able to make um, life better for others, to be able to use your unique talents and gifts to create something that changes somebody else's life or, or, or gives somebody a job at home or is such an amazing thing. It, it really is what drives this economy. And although that we don't necessarily get the respect we deserve and we don't, and you never will, um, you've got the, um, the folks back in Washington and, and locally and state governments and all that that think that they're running the show. And, but without us, they would have nothing and they would have no jobs and there would be no reason for any government or anything anywhere if there wasn't for uh, entrepreneurs. Um, we're the ones that make this thing go and whether they understand it or not and whether they're smart enough to under understand it or not really doesn't matter to us and it can't because it still has to get done and only we can do it the way it needs to be done because only we think in, the, in a manner that can see past the silliness of the here and now and really work on what's important uh, for the later, right? For what's coming down the road. So thanks again for joining me today. We will end with our little, I did not do the outro again. I'm not very good, but we'll end with it now and I will see you next time. Thanks.